right. So um, first up, uh, just a couple of links to uh, help you follow along. Uh, first, we are going to be looking at uh, the NEON data portal here, uh, data.neonscience.org. Um, and then uh, the tutorial that we're going to be following um, is at the second link. Uh, so that will be, uh, that tutorial contains uh, the R code that we'll be working with. Um, just to give you a, a heads up that I will be going through that in a slightly different order um, than it appears in the tutorial, um, but the content will be the same. Um, it's just, uh, you know, different, different parts come first uh, when, I, when I do this live. All right, so starting with the data portal. All right, so this is uh, data.neonscience.org. Um, we don't have time uh, in this uh, webinar to go through uh, everything uh, that's available on the website and data portal in detail. So I just really wanna encourage you to you know, explore all of these menus um, uh, later on on your own. There's all kinds of information about NEON data collection, uh, about you know, uh, publications and research using NEON, about uh, teaching resources, learning resources, what else NEON has to offer. Um, so definitely check those out, um, but we are going to go to the data portal. And we are going to go to this first link to get data, uh, which takes us to this explore data products page. So this is where you can find uh, information about data products, the full neon data products catalog, um, and basically just explore everything that's available and then uh, also download it. Uh, so the data product that we're going to use um, as our uh, example, uh, to download uh, is photosynthetically active radiation, um, which we can search for in this little universal search bar uh, just by searching uh, for PAR. Um, and you'll see uh, the, the data product PAR uh, comes up first. There are actually you know, several other um, data products that involve photosynthetically active radiation, um, but the search you know, has uh, a little bit of uh, intelligence behind it to know that if you type in PAR, this is this is probably what you're most interested in. Um, before we get into how to download these data, um, I do just want to point everyone to um, this uh, data product details page um, because I really, really encourage folks to check this out for any uh, data products that you're interested in working with. Uh, because this details page has a whole bunch of metadata and documentation um, about each data product. Uh, so just scrolling down to the documentation, there's this little document viewer on the page uh, where you can read through you know, this whole list of documents uh, that's available for the data product. Uh, if you keep scrolling down, there's an issue log, which is, you know, tracks uh, if there have been, you know, unexpected issues uh, with the data product. Um, again, you know, not uh, a ton of time to go through this in detail, but um, really, really encourage you to uh, keep these pages in mind uh, when you're working uh, with a new data product. Um, okay, so going back to the Explore page. So I am going to go straight to download data. And uh, that takes me to um, this uh, interactive page that helps guide me through uh, downloading the data. So the first thing to look at is this uh, availability grid. So this uh, shows the availability of data um, across uh, sites and months. So each of these little boxes represents one month at one site. Um, the gray boxes indicate that there are no data available for that uh, date and that site, uh, and the blue boxes indicate uh, that data are available. Um, so here for PAR, you can see that basically after you know, a certain point in time, there's basically always data, um, but different sites uh, became available at different times. Um, 
So that pattern is very common with the sensor data. Uh, for the observational data where you know, uh, people go out uh, into the field and collect data manually, um, you'll see that you know, we, we don't necessarily collect data in every month for every data product. Um, and so uh, this, this chart will be in many ways a little bit more informative um, for those less frequently collected data products. All right, so we are going to um, download data from uh, the Wind River Experimental Forest, that's WREF. Um, so if you can follow along here uh, to download the data, um, this is what we're going to start out uh, working with in the tutorial. So select that site, and then we are going to get just uh, the most recent couple of months of data. So this little chart lets us select 2022. And now we need to select months. So we are going to get, um, so that was selecting the start date, uh, July 2022. And then we are going to select an end date, um, which in this case is September 2022. Um, I am guessing the September data are not actually online yet, um, but basically it's just saying, you know, that's that's the last uh, date of data that will be um, that will be considered for download. All right, so moving on, um, this next page asks if you want to include documentation. So we were just looking at documentation on the data product details page. Um, if you select the box for include, then those documents will also be downloaded with your data. Uh, here, we're going to we're going to include those those documents. Um, I generally recommend doing that sort of the first time you download any data product. Obviously, you don't need to do it every time because you'll just get the same copies of documents over and over again. Uh, okay, then. Uh, you get a choice for, for most, although not all, data products. You get a choice between a basic and an expanded data package. Um, so uh, in general, the expanded package is going to include more uh, information about data quality. Um, so for the sensor data, um, it's pretty consistent that the basic package has, um, you know, things like mean, minimum, maximum, you know, um, basic uh, statistics from the data, and then also just a single sort of summary quality flag. Whereas if you download expanded, you get um, many, many quality flags about, you know, what, what specific uh, quality issues there might have been, you know, was there a, a spike in a data value? Was there a null in a data value? Um, those kinds of details. Um, and for the observational data, it tends to be Things like, uh, you know, if um, analyses were performed at a lab, um, what were the the results of like, you know, standards run as unknowns um, at that lab? Those things tend to be in the expanded package. Uh, so for this tutorial, we're just going to download basic. Um, but if you're, you know, interested in sort of more exhaustive analyses and you really want to know the information in those quality flags, um, you would do uh, expanded. So then you just check the box to say. Uh, yes, I agree to NEON's policies, and now it takes you to this final page where uh, you can download the data. Um, before I click that button, I just want to note uh, there are these um, recommended citations uh, on this page. So um, definitely, if you download some NEON data and you write a paper about it, that is amazing. That is what we are trying to achieve use uh, these data citations um, in your paper uh, when you do that. Okay, so clicking the download data and button. Claire, if I can just interrupt real quick. Also, the estimated size of the download is in the top right corner. So that's something to be aware of in case you selected way too much. Yeah, so that, that is super useful. Um, and that is one reason why uh, for tutorials, I usually do the basic package because it keeps it much smaller. Um, and you know we, we don't want to uh, take forever here. Um, but this can give you uh, an idea of how long your download will take. OK, so you can see at the bottom uh, of this menu what's been downloaded. Um, 
is a zip file. So now I'm just going to move these windows out of the way. And we can take a look um, at what is inside that zip file. All right, so here's what I downloaded. Just unzip it and look inside that folder. Okay, so what is in this folder? Um, these PDFs, uh, that is because we checked that uh, include documents um, checkbox. So those are uh, things like, you know, algorithm documentation, the quick start guide, um, et cetera, uh, basically describing the processing that went into this data product. Um, and then we have these three folders. Uh, so apparently um, I was wrong and the September data have actually already been published. Um, so these three folders are uh, for each of the three months uh, of data that we downloaded because we started uh, our criteria in July. So we got July, August, and September. Uh, you can see here this WERF uh, from Wind River. So this is just Wind River data. If we had downloaded multiple sites, we would also have folders uh, for each site. If you look inside those folders, uh, you see we have a whole bunch um, of uh, comma-separated files. And uh, if you look in in a little bit more detail, you can see some of them are labeled one minute, some are 30 minute, and then there's this uh, sort of code of different uh, numbers here. Basically what this represents is uh, there are data that are averaged um, to once a minute and data that are averaged to uh, once every 30 minutes. And then there are sensors uh, at multiple levels on the tower. Uh, so you can actually see this in um, my computer background. So here's you know a sensor boom, here's a sensor boom, Here's a sensor boom higher on the tower. This is a fairly short tower um, in this picture. Wind River is a taller one, but there is a PAR sensor on each of these levels. Um, and so you're also getting files from each of those levels. Okay, so that is a lot of data files. Um, and uh, ideally, instead of having you know several folders of files and then several um, sets of files for for sensors at different levels, you would have it a little bit more aggregated. Uh, and so that is exactly um, what uh, Neon Utilities is going to do for us, is um, do that, that aggregation to put the data into a little bit of a more tractable format. Um, so at this point, um, we are going to move over uh, to our studio. Um, and uh, start seeing what the Neon Utilities package does for us. Um, so if you can follow along here, um, that will be great as well. Uh, so I've just got um, a blank uh, R script here. Um, and this is now I'm going to be following, uh, like I said, in a slightly different order, the code um, in the tutorial. So we start by uh, loading the packages that we need. Um, uh, it was in um, the information on the website to install this Neon Utilities package before the webinar. Um, if you didn't get a chance to do that, you just need to run uh, install packages Neon Utilities, um, and then you can run um, this uh, library line to, to actually bring Neon Utilities into your environment. Um, so uh, go ahead and do that. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I'm not running the install packages line because of course I already have Neon Utilities um, loaded. The other um, package that we're gonna need uh, is the raster package. So loading that as well. Okay. And so now uh, we are going to, um, like I said, use uh, Neon Utilities to 
um, bring together uh, those files that we downloaded. So function to do that is called stack by table. Um, if you're not familiar with this interface in RStudio, you, you know, start to type the function name and it will very helpfully pop up that this is a function in the Neon Utilities package and here's some information about its inputs. Um, so that can be useful. Um, the only uh, input that we need to give to stack by table is the file path um, to where that zip file uh, is located. So I um, had put that on my desktop. So I just need to go to desktop neonpar.zip and run that line. So now it's going to give a little bit of information, a couple of progress bars as it does its thing. Um, and so it tells us, all right, it stacked a table for the one minute data, it stacked a table for the 30 minute data, and then it tells us um, a little bit about where uh, it saved those files. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of what did it actually do during those little progress bar activities? So if I go back to my desktop now, I have a little neon par folder. If I open that up now, I still have all of those PDFs of the documentation, but now instead of having three folders for each of the months of data that I downloaded, I just have this one folder that says stacked files. And what I have in there is uh, one file with uh, the data averaged to one minute um, and one file with a 30 minute averaging interval. And then uh, the rest of these are uh, metadata files. So uh, sensor positions um, has information about, uh, you know, the, the locations of the sensors on those booms. Um, variables we will look at in a second that has uh, metadata about the data that we downloaded. So let's just take a look at what is in that 30 minute file. And, all right, so what we've got here is, uh, you can see from the start, uh, start date and end date. So this is uh, the start and end of each averaging interval. So you can see they're each 30 minutes. For each of those 30 minutes, we have, um, mean, minimum, maximum variance, um, uh, sensor uh, specific uncertainty, um, and so forth. And then on the left, uh, we have um, the site ID and the horizontal and vertical position. So that horizontal and vertical position are the locations of those sensors. They're not the precise locations, but sort of uh, indices for the locations where those sensors are found. Um, and so if you scroll down, you'll see, you know, okay, we started at uh, um, a vertical index of 10. Here it's, you know, 50. Keep, keep going, 60, 70. I think this tower, yeah, it goes up to 80. Um, so basically that's the, the eight levels um, of the tower at Wind River um, and the sensors found at each level. Okay, so... Basically, what Stack by Table did was it took all of those individual files um, and merged them into this file and the one minute averaging interval file. Uh, and, and indicated you know, the, the source of that um, by giving the sensor uh, location. And then the variables file uh, is really helpful. And I always recommend taking a look at that. Um, because it provides the definitions uh, for each of those columns that we found um, in the data file. So, you know, here we're looking at, okay, you know, maybe, maybe these are fairly intuitive, par mean, par minimum, par maximum, um, but, you know, you might encounter some uh, field names or column names uh, that are less intuitive, uh, and you can find those here in this variables file. So you can see that um, the column name of par mean 
has a, a description here, the arithmetic mean of photosynthetically active radiation. Uh, it tells you the units. Um, so, you know, standard for PAR, this is in micromoles per square meter per second. Um, and then uh, whether it's, um, whether that particular field is in the basic or expanded package. So we downloaded the, ba the basic package. You can see here all of these uh, quality flags and quality metrics that we would have gotten in the expanded package. Okay. Um, I think looking at the time, um, I am not going to show you how. So, um, so right now, those data that we stacked are just stored on my desktop. Um, so there is uh, a way that you can um, use Neon Utilities to uh, load those data into R where it will um, use the data type to sort of assign um, classes in R. Um, that function is called read table neon. Uh, I'm just gonna skip that step um, in the interests of time and instead show you uh, neon utilities also has a method um, that basically does everything that we just did plus the loading data into R. So it, it downloads data, um, uh, using the API, the, the NEON um, application programming interface, which is just a sort of machine to machine um, system. It does the stacking and it loads the data into your R environment, basically all in one step. So uh, I'm gonna show you how to do that. So to load um, exactly the same data that we just downloaded, um, I'm gonna name this object um, PR. The function um, is uh, load by product. Um, and it needs uh, a few more inputs um, than stack by table. So the first input uh, is uh, DPID, that stands for data product ID. Um, the place where you find that is if we go back to the data portal. Uh, and go to this uh, explore data products page that has the, the menu of all the data products. Right under the data products name, you'll see this identifier. Um, and that is the data product ID um, that uh, load by product needs in order to know um, what to do. So dp1.00024.001. So we go back to R and that's what we're gonna enter here. So we are downloading par. Um, we are downloading from just one site. You can put multiple sites in here, um, but in this case, uh, we're looking just for Wind River. Um, we want to get only certain dates. We don't want to download all the par data that's ever been collected at Wind River. So we're going to do 202207 to end date 202209. Um, here, this start date and end date uh, only go to the year and the month um, because that's the, the resolution of what's available to download from Neon. Um, basically, if you if you put it, if you specify it all the way to a day it would still just download everything from that month. Um, so we leave the day off uh, just so that that's clear. Uh, the download package is basic. Um, and I think, I think that is everything I needed to enter. Uh, I will find out in a second. So, okay. So I ran that line and the first thing it did was it said, okay, finding files, but now it pauses uh, and it says, hey, you're gonna download 104 megabytes of files. Are you okay with that? Uh, and this, this step is here kind of for the same reason that the, the download size is displayed on the portal, just as a check in case you're downloading a whole bunch of data and you didn't mean to, uh, this gives you the opportunity to stop. 
Um, there is um, an option to bypass this when you uh, when you make the function call, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. But here I'm just going to say yes, I want to proceed. So now it gives me some more progress bars saying that it is downloading. And now, now we are back to something we've seen before where it says, hey, I'm stacking the one minute table, I'm stacking the 30 minute table. And now it's thinking for a minute. Um, this, uh, yeah, there we go. And now we have uh, this object PR. And I'm going to look at what is inside that object. And here, this should also be familiar. Um, these are the same uh, names as the objects that we had um, in uh, what we downloaded to the desktop. So we've got a one minute table, a 30 minute table, uh, the variables file that tells us about the contents of those, uh, sensor positions that gives us information about the locations of the sensors, um, and uh, the readme and issue log. So uh, I can just take a look at what is inside there. So let's view the 30 minute file. You can see again, this is the same thing that we got through sort of the, the other access method through going through the data portal. Um, we have the same contents in this file, um, except in this case, the file is now loaded into our R environment. Um, and so just to uh, look at something a little bit more interesting than um, a, a bare spreadsheet, um, we can just plot a little bit of that data. Um, so let's see, we're going to plot mean par as a function of start date time. Uh, the data source um, is going to be that 30 minute file. And we are going to subset it to uh, just the 30 minute data um, where the vertical position is 80. Um, and we're doing that just because that uh, is the top of the tower. Um, and it can be a little bit confusing um, to try to view you know, par from many levels of the tower at once. Um, and we're gonna make that a line plot. So there we go. Uh, we can we can see if we uh, expand this out quite a bit um, that, you know, you can see the diurnal cycle where sun comes up, sun goes down. Uh, it's actually a little bit easier to see if we compress it that you can also see, you know, as we move into the fall, uh, the, the light intensity um, at, the, at the peak every day um, is declining. Um, and also wind rivers in the Pacific Northwest, you can also see as we get into the fall, it gets a little cloudier. Um, so that's also uh, sort of a reassurance um, that, you know, the data that we've downloaded basically look like we expect them to. Okay, so what I'm going to do next, uh, this walked us through uh, downloading um, and, and taking a quick look at um, sensor data. Uh, what I'm going to do next is walk through using uh, what's available in Neon Utilities for doing the same, basically downloading and, and taking a quick look at um, observational data, so data collected by humans, um, and remote sensing data. Before I jump into that, any questions um, or, or concerns about what we've done so far? All right, we'll keep going. Okay, 
So what we're gonna look at next um, is observational data. So um, in this case, uh, we are going to download um, aquatic plant chemistry data. So going back to the data portal, um, let's see, yes, okay, if I, uh, conveniently, if I type aquatic, that is actually um, the first data product that shows up. In this case, that's a coincidence, um, but that's convenient for us. So we're going to download aquatic plant bryophyte chemical properties. The data product ID uh, is here. And so that is what we need uh, for um, downloading, again, using load by product. So I'm going to call this one uh, AP Chem for aquatic plant chemistry. I am, again, going to use the load by product function. Uh, the data product ID in this case is DP1.20063 uh, that we just saw um, on uh, the Explore Data Products page. Um, in this case, we're going to download data from three sites. Uh, so that's going to be uh, Prairie Lake, uh, Suggs Lake, and Tulick Lake. Um, so this is, uh, I think, let's see, Prairie Lake is in the upper Midwest, Suggs I think is in Florida, and Tulick is in Alaska. So we're, we're looking sort of across uh, the range um, of, uh, of sites that NEON has. Um, in this case, we are going to download uh, the expanded package. Um, that actually has more to do with sort of a, a follow-on tutorial that uses these same data that needs the expanded package. Uh, but so that's going to download um, everything uh, that's available, including the, the quality control information. Um, and this time, I'm going to show you how to bypass that little question about um, uh, that we had here of here's your file size, do you want to proceed? So you can avoid that or sort of skip that by using this um, final input here that says check size. Oh, uh, except I typed true. And actually, we want check size equals false um, because we're going to skip uh, the, the size checking step. Um, so use that with caution. It's obviously available, um, but definitely only use that if you're really sure that you know your download is a manageable size or that you're prepared to have the download take a long time. So we're gonna run that. Uh, and you can see it tells you it's downloading 23 files. Here it goes. And right then it did the stacking super fast. Um, so this is pretty typical of the, the difference between the sensor data and the observational data. Um, the observational data, uh, you know, they're, they're typically larger um, because they, you know, have measurements at things like, you know, once every minute. Um, whereas just inherently data that, that are um, observed by humans uh, are not going to be um, as frequent um, and as large. Because um, if you remember, we only downloaded three months of data for PAR. Um, here, we downloaded three sites, but we just you know, didn't specify a start date and an end date. So it's downloaded the data for all time. Um, and that was still pretty fast. Um, and it stacked the data pretty fast. All right, so what do we have um, in this object that we've downloaded? Uh, so again, some of this is gonna be familiar. Um, we have a variables file. So just like for par, this is going to give you uh, the names and the definitions and the units uh, for each of the column names in uh, the data files, the data tables. Uh, we've got a readme that gives you sort of basic information about the data product. Um, there's a couple of uh, additional metadata files uh, that we didn't have with the sensor data. So categorical codes that gives information about um, the values of categorical data 
uh, in the observational data files. Um, and validation gives some information about how the data were validated when they were ingested um, into the NEON system. Uh, I'm not going to go into those in detail, um, but those you know, can also be uh, obviously useful to you. OK, and then this, these first five are the actual um, data tables. So let's take a look um, at the external lab data per sample table. Um, Uh, cause I really, I just want to show you sort of, you know, what's, what's similar and what's different, um, between the sensor data and the observational data. So you can see, you know, there are some similarities. There's, you know, a site ID that tells you, uh, what site the data were collected at. There's a date. Um, this is, you know, sometimes typical, sometimes not for the observational data that it just gives a day. Um, and doesn't go, you know, down to the the minute or second the way that the sensor data do. Um, and again, that is that is just because of the nature of human data data collection. Um, that you know, in some cases, but often, in some cases, it's that precise. But often, it's just you know, we went and collected samples on this day. Okay, so then scrolling to the right, you have information about. Uh, the sample. So this is the sample identifier. Um, uh, it's very reassuring that all of these have condition OK in the sample condition. So that can flag for you um, if there was you know, a problem with the sample during collection or processing. It tells you where those samples were processed. Um, and then scrolling out here, we get to the actual data. Um, so here we've got uh, an analyte, which uh, is either carbon or nitrogen. If we scroll down a bit, yes, we will get to some that also have um, stable isotope ratios uh, for 13C and 15N. Um, and then the analyte concentration gives you uh, the actual analyte value uh, for the analyte that's being um, uh, tested in each of these uh, rows of data. Okay, so what we can do with that, um, going back to, let's look at something uh, a little bit more interesting than a spreadsheet. Uh, we can take a look at um, the, let's um, check out the 13C, uh, content of um, plants at the different sites. So that means we're going to look at analyte concentration versus site ID. Um, and the data source is going to be the aquatic plant chemistry, uh, plant external lab data per sample. We are going to subset that to just um, the 13C data and see what that looks like. All right, so this shows us sort of a, a range um, of carbon isotope concentrations at the three different sites. Um, I think I need to expand this out a little bit to get that, yeah, the middle site name. Uh, so you can see, you know, lighter uh, at Prairie Lake and, um, sorry, the way around, uh, more enriched at Prairie Lake um, and lighter in 13C um, at Suggs and Tulick. Uh, but what would, what, you know, you might really like to see is, okay, you know, how does that map onto uh, the different species that you find at those different sites? Um, and so this is where we get into, we've got, you know, these multiple data tables. So if we go back to um, looking at uh, 
this um, uh, the analytes from the lab that we downloaded, and we scroll across. Um, you can see this doesn't tell us uh, what species each of those samples uh, came from. But if we look um, at the biomass table and scroll over here, we find uh, the scientific name um, for, uh, again, each of those uh, sample IDs which are you know, the corresponding sample IDs that we saw um, in the, the analyte table. So what we need to do um, is bring those two tables together and then uh, we'll be able to uh, see what the, the 13C concentration was um, for each of those species. So, um, just to sort of uh, back up a little bit, that's really typical um, of what you're going to find in the observational data. So um, the, the data tables for NEON observational data typically represent sort of a, a sampling activity that took place at a particular time. So, you know, the, the clip harvest table, okay, they went out and collected a bunch of aquatic plants. Uh, they, you know, uh, weighed those to get biomass, um, and then sent them out for uh, analysis at a lab to get uh, the carbon and nitrogen analytes. Um, and then these other two tables um, are the quality control tables um, from from the laboratory information. Um, and so. Uh, it's it's very typical that you would have to bring together data um, from from multiple tables often to do analyses um, of uh, observational data because often you know the the information that you're looking for was collected at different times or by different people um, and ended up in different data tables. So they're just they're just relational tables. Um, okay. So before um, I do that step, uh, there is um, a way to make uh, some of these um, getting at the tables a little bit simpler. Um, so I've been using you know, the, the name of the object that we identified and the dollar sign to get to the tables that are you know, within this list object. Uh, there is um, a command that can let you bring those tables into the environment individually. So that is list to environment, um, which is what it sounds like. We have a named list and we want to bring the elements of that list directly into the environment. Um, we want to bring uh, the objects from the list APChem into the global environment. So I run that, and now you can see in my environment, I have individual objects uh, for each of those tables. Um, so, you know, obviously you can do this either way. Uh, a lot of people find that this uh, makes it a little bit more convenient. So what we're gonna do now um, is, merge the two tables. Um, so uh, I'm naming this new object uh, APCT and uh, I'm going to use the merge function. Um, you can also use uh, the, the table joining functions um, from DeepFire if you're more familiar with those. They do uh, basically the same thing. Um, and I'm going to merge the biomass table and the plant external lab data per sample. And I'm going to do the join on um, the sample ID because that is the common identifier between those two tables. Um, I'm also going to include the name location, domain ID, uh, and site ID, 
those um, are not uh, strictly necessary, um, but including them in what you join by uh, keeps um, the system from duplicating those columns. Um, so you don't have to have um, uh, basically one from each of the original tables. Uh, so you might be thinking, um, how, how did I know to do that? Um, so going back to um, the uh, data product catalog and the product details page, if I scroll down here to this quick start guide and look on the second page of the quick start guide, uh, there's a little table of instructions for table joining. Uh, and it says, all right, you've got the aquatic plant biomass table and the aquatic plant uh, external lab table. And what am I joining by? Um, interesting. Uh, this is telling me that the name of the field in the biomass table is chem subsample ID and the name of the field in the external lab data um, table is sample ID, uh, which is actually not what I just did. <laughs> um, since I uh, indicated that it would be named sample ID in both tables, um, I think what is going on and the difference there is that um, the sam subsample ID and the sample ID uh, actually have the same um, value. They're, they're, you know, like the, the actual string of the identifier is the same. Um, and so it's working either way um, because I know that this tutorial works. <laughs> um, but uh, if you wanted to be precise, um, you can specify this, uh, this by can be specific to um, the, uh, the name of the field um, in each of the tables. They don't actually have to be identical. Okay, so now I have um, a merged table, which I can take a look at. And here, so the, the fields that you join on will be on the far left. So here's the sample ID. Um, and yes, confirming that this chem subsample ID is identical, um, which is why that that difference um, wasn't actually significant. Um, and you can see here, we've got the scientific name from the biomass table and all of the columns from the biomass table. And then we scroll over and now we also have all of the columns from uh, the chemical analyte table. So that enables us now to um, make a plot um, of uh, 13C as a function of um, species rather than by site. So we want anal analyte concentration by scientific name, uh, the data coming from that merged table that we just made. And we are again going to subset to um, just uh, the 13C data. And there we go. Um, so if I expand this out, uh, actually I'm going to make one other change here, um, which is LAS equals two. That is just going to turn the axis labels uh, vertical um, to make it a little bit more visible. So, well, I could, I could futz with the size a little bit more to make that more legible, but basically you can now see um, the isotope uh, concentration per species. Um, and you can see that there's just a small number um, of species that are driving um, those uh, um, those cases where uh, the 13C um, is more enriched. All right, so uh, that is just kind of a, 
you know, again, like, like the PAR data, a very quick um, example of, of what it looks like to work with the observational data. Um, so now I'm just going to quickly demo um, downloading and taking a look at um, the uh, remote sensing data. So So the remote sensing data are a little bit different. Um, so both the sensor data and the observational data um, we got in these these tabular data files. So tabular meaning you know we've got rows and columns, um, and you know they they contain all the information. The remote sensing data, um, depending on on which data product you're accessing, they they come in various formats. Um, some of them are in HDF5 files, which is this sort of uh, like nested um, self-describing um, tables, uh, and um, a lot of them are in uh, rasters, uh, where you have different layers of information, um, uh, you know, contained in in one object. So, um, so the functions that you use in Neon Utilities to access those data are different. Um, there's uh, a function called by file AOP, uh, which downloads um, everything for a particular uh, date and site. Um, we are going to look at um, by tile AOP, which downloads um, a single tile from the mosaic data products. Um, so this is uh, only, only a subset of the AOP data are available in tiles. Um, but I use this in the tutorial, um, again, because of the download size, uh, because the AOP data are really, really large. Um, and so downloading everything uh, for a date and site is sort of unmanageable um, in, in the time frame that we have in a tutorial. Uh, so we're just going to download a single tile of data. Um, and a tile, uh, in this case, is one kilometer by one kilometer. Um, so we so the first input. Um, is the same uh, as we had in load by product. It's the data product identifier. Uh, what we're going to download um, is the canopy height model data product, um, also known as ecosystem structure. Um, and that data product uh, has the identifier um, dp3.30015.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0
And again, I'm going to get the little message that says, hey, this is the size of what you're trying to download. Um, in this case, it's only four megabytes. Uh, and so, yes, we want to proceed. Um, and again, that's because this is a, you know, a one kilometer tile. Um, if you download everything for a site, it's, it's not unusual um, in AOP to be talking about gigabytes um, of data. Okay, so uh, this tells me, you know, where that was downloaded. And now um, I can, uh, you know, now, now that it's available locally, I can read it into R. Um, so I'm just going to, oops, I'm going to be up here. I'm just going to name this object CHM for canopy height model. Uh, I can use the raster function in the raster package to read that in. Um, and this is where um, if you uh, use R a lot, um, you're going to be familiar with this, uh, that it has um, this tab complete feature where, you know, I start writing out a file path. And if at this point I hit tab, it starts showing me the contents of that file. Um, and you will see as we go through here, there are a whole lot of nested folders here. And you can just use the tab complete to keep digging down through those nested folders all the way to the file at the bottom of the nest, um, which is a .tiff. And that's, that's how you know you've reached the end, um, is that instead of you know hitting tab and getting another folder name that ends in a slash, there's no slash. We get a .tiff. We have reached um, an actual file. So I run that line, and now I have an object called CHM, and I can just say plot that CHM object, and it gives me a little picture. Um, so this is uh, the canopy height in that tile that we downloaded, where this, you know, this pink uh, value is uh, short stature, and the greens um, are tall. This is in meters, uh, so you can see, you know, again, Wind River in the Pacific Northwest has some very tall trees, um, but there is some sort of, you know, clear-cut situation uh, here in the corner uh, where the trees are much, much shorter. Um, and this uh, this little error thing here, this is just uh, our studio sometimes gets unhappy if you have a very, very small plot window. Um, so that's that's all that it was complaining about there. All right. Um, so before before we break uh, for questions, um, I just want to go back to um, to link you to sort of where you, where you can go to learn more. This was, you know, a very basic introduction to, you know, how to access and, you know, basics of how to navigate uh, each of the three data types that NEON has, the sensor, observational, and remote sensing data. Um, but obviously there's much, much more to learn. Um, so we have um, more than a hundred uh, tutorials on the NEON website. This, uh, series that's linked here um, is a set of tutorials that we recommend for as you're getting started. Um, and so you'll see if you go there, there's kind of a, a block of introductory tutorials um, that you know go a little bit farther than this one. And then there's sort of a, a pick and choose, you know, uh, tutorials that are more specific to specific kinds of data, but that are still uh, fairly introductory um, and designed for, for people who are getting um, you know, just getting familiar uh, with neon data.